For those of you I haven't met this evening, my name's Michael Lestrange. I'm the head of the National Security College. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here this evening on behalf of a myriad uh, of ANU uh, organisations. Um, we have, of course, the National Security College, uh, where I am at. Uh, we also have this evening uh, sponsored by the Japan Institute, um, by the Strategic and Defence uh, Studies Centre, uh, by the Department of Political and Social Change, uh, and by the ARC Centre for Excellence in Policing and Security. This is a true rainbow coalition um, of the ANU. And one of the reasons I think that uh, we've come together with such enthusiasm this evening uh, is because of the uh, professional standing and preeminence of our speaker, uh, and also because of the topicality of the issues that he's addressing. Uh, Professor Mike Mochizuki uh, holds the Japan-US Relations Chair uh, in memory of Gaston Seeger at the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University. And before that, of course, he has taught uh, at many institutions, including the Brookings Institution, uh, Rand, Yale, uh, and the University of Southern California. Uh, as you will all know, he's built uh, an enviable international reputation for the quality of his research, for his mastery of detail, and for his capacity to relate that detail to a clear conceptual strategic framework. Um, I think in addition to that um, academic standing uh, of an extremely high order, um, Mike has also won a reputation as a public intellectual who can convey complex strategic issues to a wider audience, and many of us envy that capacity. So, um, Mike, we extend to you the warmest of welcomes this evening. Um, we're delighted to have you here and all of the uh, organisations at the ANU that are sponsoring this event tonight um, are very appreciative of your presence. I think the other reason why um, uh, this is engendering such interest is not just uh, Mike's preeminence, but also the issues that he's addressing. The future of the US-Japan security relationship, uh, the prospects for the political and economic changes that are underway in Japan, the implications of the uh, US rebalancing to the Asia-Pacific region, the interaction of all those issues with the rise of China, nuclear brinkmanship on the Korean Peninsula, the rise of territorial uh, and maritime contestability uh, in the region, and if that weren't enough, um, the future of bilateralism in the management of alliance relationships and security partnerships. All of these issues matter enormously to the countries of the Asia Pacific, um, and in particular they matter enormously to Australia, which has such critical relationships um, with the major powers. So. Um, we're delighted that this evening is, is occurring. We really appreciate the time that you've spared for us tonight and we very much look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lestrange, uh, for that overly kind uh, introduction. Uh, it's really an honor and, uh, to be here in Australia and to be here uh, at the National Security College of uh, ANU. Uh, this is uh, my first uh, trip to Australia. Uh, uh, my uh, good friend uh, from uh, University of Southern California days, uh, Bill Tell, who's in the, in the background, uh, in the back, uh, uh, talked to me about uh, possibly coming out to Australia uh, many years ago, and I still can't believe that we finally uh, realized uh, this. And I'm learning a lot, and I'm looking forward uh, to my stay this week uh, here in, in Canberra. Vera, and I want to thank all the institutions that are sponsoring uh, this event, and also I want to thank uh, uh, Ricky Kirsten. Uh, we met in Washington uh, a couple of months ago as we were planning out this trip, and I really uh, also appreciate her help uh, in this. Um, Michael laid out a very broad agenda, and uh, I've been only given about 30 minutes uh, to cover all of this, and so there's no way I can do justice to all of these uh, very complicated uh, issues, and I want to leave plenty of time for 
uh, Q&A. So uh, I, I uh, will touch lightly on some of these issues, but basically I want to focus uh, on uh, the evolution of uh, Japanese security policy uh, and the U.S.-Japan uh, alliance uh, in the context of uh, East Asian uh, security. Now, I uh, initially started studying Japanese security policy in 1981. Uh, I had uh, had my training in political science and comparative politics, and I really didn't study much about international security. Uh, but uh, uh, one of my mentors at Harvard, uh, Ezra Vogel, uh, was kind enough to offer me a postdoctoral fellowship uh, to retool uh, in the field of international security uh, uh, studies and look at the uh, Japanese security policy and the U.S.-Japan uh, 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 alliance. Now, uh, frankly, he was just bailing me out. Uh, I, I was uh, finishing up my dissertation and was depressed to see that there was not a single position uh, in Japanese politics uh, in the United States. And so I was contemplating uh, getting out of the academic field, and uh, Ezra came and bailed me uh, out. Uh, well, uh, so it was in 1981 that I started uh, looking at Japanese security policy and the U.S.-Japan alliance, and I was told by many of my peers uh, that that's, uh, those are oxymorons. There's no such thing uh, as Japanese security policy. Uh, there's only an American policy, and there's no such thing as the U.S.-Japan alliance. Uh, Japan is simply a protectorate uh, of uh, the United States, and there really isn't uh, much to study uh, seriously uh, here. Uh, I was quite dismayed by uh, that, uh, uh, those remarks, and so I sought out uh, one of my senpai. You know, senpai in Japanese is someone uh, who's your senior that you look up to, uh, and he was a Japanese-American scholar that I admired. Uh, he had just taken a position at Stanford University, and he wrote one of the few dissertations at the time on uh, Japanese national security policy and the debate uh, about nuclear uh, armaments. And so I sought him out to get some guidance on how to think about Japanese security policy. And uh, to uh, my dismay, uh, 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 this uh, Japanese-American uh, political scientist uh, who just recently re retired from uh, Stanford University uh, uh, said that, well, you know, I studied uh, Japanese security policy and wrote my PhD dissertation at the University of Michigan on this, uh, but I've been told by my uh, colleagues at Stanford uh, that if you continue to study Japanese security policy, you will not get tenure uh, at Stanford, and so he switched to uh, uh, studying uh, Japanese political economy and went on to write some seminal works on Japanese industrial uh, uh, policy. Now, of course, today uh, the field is completely uh, different. Uh, there are uh, uh, scholars, uh, young scholars, and not so young scholars uh, who have written uh, seminal works uh, with great theoretical uh, sophistication on Japanese security policy uh, and the U.S.-Japan uh, alliance, and who writes about Japanese industrial policy uh, these days. Uh, and I think one reason uh, for this uh, is that uh, over the years, uh, Japan has gradually emerged uh, as a Japanese security actor and, and certainly as a factor uh, in East Asian uh, security uh, uh, relations. And this has been a, a very incremental uh, policy uh, or a, a, an incremental process. And uh, you know, looking back in 1981, um, the sorts of things that Japan is doing now in the security field were, were really unimaginable uh, at that time. Uh, and, you know, if you can just kind of go through the milestones uh, in, in the early 1980s, the Japanese uh, put out 1,000 nautical miles of sea lane security uh, as uh, one of the missions uh, for uh, its uh, defense uh, policy. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, it moved uh, towards uh, participating in a non-combat way uh, in uh, UN uh, peacekeeping missions. Uh, it also moved to provide rear area support uh, for U.S. military contingencies uh, that might affect uh, Japan's security interests, even though uh, there is no uh, a direct attack on Japanese territory. Uh, and then uh, uh, we see J Japanese uh, self-defense uh, force ships 
uh, refueling naval ships not only from the United States but other uh, nations uh, in the Indian Ocean. And then you saw the deployment of ground self-defense forces in Iraq uh, to help with the post-war reconstruction. I mean, these sorts of steps were just really unimaginable uh, in the context of the early uh, 1980s. And these incremental steps uh, towards normalization of Japan as a security actor uh, were responses, reactions uh, to developments uh, in the international security uh, environment. And this normalization process did not start uh, with the end of the Cold War. Uh, in fact, uh, when I st started studying Japanese security policy, we were at the height of the second phase uh, of uh, the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. And the Japanese were concerned about the rise of Soviet military capabilities uh, in the Northwest uh, Pacific. Uh, and then uh, after, the, after the end of the Cold War, we have the Persian Gulf crisis of uh, 1990 and 91. And it was uh, in 1991 that I took my first uh, trip to China and uh, understood uh, what an impact uh, that uh, the uh, U.S. military capabilities, tactics, and strategy on, uh, in, uh, in the Iraq War, what an impact that that made on, uh, on Chinese uh, military analysts. And then Japan responded uh, to the North Korean nuclear uh, uh, crisis and the, the development of ballistic missiles by the North Koreans. Uh, and then the 1996 Taiwan Strait Crisis, and then finally we have 9-11 uh, and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And so uh, it was in response to each of these developments that Japan pushed the envelope a little bit more uh, in terms of becoming a much more of a no normal uh, military uh, uh, actor. Uh, but in my opinion, that none of this incremental normalization of Japan as a security actor entailed a major uh, strategic or military uh, breakthrough. Um, you know, for those of you uh, who are familiar with Japanese di diplomacy, uh, you know that one of the major kind of uh, concepts uh, in the study of Japanese post-war foreign policy is the so-called uh, Yoshida uh, doctrine. Uh, uh, there is no paper that says this is a Yoshida doctrine, but it was basically uh, the broad parameters of Japanese foreign uh, policy that were established uh, during the time of the peace negotiations between the United States and Japan, uh, which was overseen uh, by the uh, great uh, post-war prime minister, uh, Shigeru uh, Yoshida. Uh, and uh, there, there's been quite a bit of debate over the last two decades whether or not Japan has basically broken out of uh, the so-called uh, Yoshida uh, doctrine. Well, in my view, uh, all of these incremental steps, as significant uh, as they have been, uh, did not amount to a breakout uh, from the Yoshida uh, doctrine. Uh, even with these incremental steps towards a much more normal Japan, uh, Japan continued uh, to rely ultimately on the United States uh, for security. Uh, Japan continued uh, to permit the United States to have numerous and intrusive bases and forces on Japanese territory. And most importantly, uh, Japanese policymakers tended to defer uh, to the United States uh, regarding the actual location and composition of these uh, forces. And thirdly, uh, Japan continued despite the steps towards normalization, continue to adhere to a strictly defensive defense posture, what the Japanese call senshu boe, uh, which means that Japan cannot use force except uh, what is minimally necessary for its own self-defense. Uh, and therefore, uh, Japan cannot, even though it has the right of collective self-defense, cannot exercise that right of uh, self, uh, collective self-defense. And you would wonder, uh, if you have that right, but you can't exercise it, then why do you have uh, that uh, right? But that was the basic parameters of Japanese security policy 
uh, that was the legacy of uh, the post-war settlement overseen uh, by Prime Minister Shigeru uh, Yoshida. So uh, these steps and in the incremental steps in the normalization of uh, Japan as a security actor did not entail a rejection of the Yoshida Doctrine. Uh, I believe uh, Japan uh, had merely recalibrated this doctrine as a pragmatic response uh, to uh, the changing external environment. In a sense, it was a version upgrade. And now you can kind of think of Japan as using version 4.0 uh, of uh, the Yoshida uh, Doctrine. But I think now we are really uh, at the cusp of a major uh, turning point. Uh, in the last uh, several years, uh, there have been challenges uh, to the Yoshida Doctrine uh, from both uh, the center left uh, and from the center uh, right. And so uh, we uh, may be uh, at a critical moment in the post-World War II history of uh, Japan. Now, from the center left, uh, the challenge uh, came uh, from uh, Prime Minister Yukio uh, Hatoyama. And it's kind of uh, interesting historically uh, because the, one of the major challengers to Shigeru Yoshida uh, was uh, Yukio Hatoyama's uh, grandfather, uh, Ichiro uh, Hatoyama, who was prime minister during the mid-1950s. Uh, and Hatoyama, although quite awkwardly, but nevertheless, I think he articulated a new vision for Japanese foreign and defense policy. In some sense, it was a Japanese version of a rebalance, a rebalance of Japanese foreign and defense policy uh, after uh, the Liberal Democratic Party and especially uh, after uh, the long administration of Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi, uh, who had steered uh, uh, Japanese security policy to a very tight embrace uh, of the United States. And so this challenge to the Yoshida Doctrine uh, came uh, with a, uh, an amazing defeat of the LDP uh, and the rise of the Democratic Party uh, of Japan, the first uh, election in which uh, there was a clear electoral mandate to throw out uh, the party in power. And so what uh, Hatoyama articulated was, in a sense, uh, both uh, bre breathtaking and unnerving. Uh, he talked about a more equal alliance relationship with the United States in which Japan would exercise uh, more diplomatic autonomy. Uh, secondly, uh, he indicated that Japan would no longer be willing to defer to the United States regarding the U.S. force structure and posture in Japan. And as a symbol of this, uh, he vowed uh, to review not only the status of forces agreement uh, with the United States, but to review the 2006 uh, base realignment plan in Okinawa, uh, uh, and which according to this plan entailed uh, the construction of a new Marine Corps air station uh, uh, in uh, Okinawa uh, to replace uh, the Futema Marine Air Station. Uh, he vowed that in the very least, uh, the new uh, uh, marine facility should be moved outside of Okinawa Prefecture, that he would not tolerate the building of a new U.S. military facility on Okinawa, despite the fact uh, that uh, the United States and the Japanese governments had just uh, signed uh, an agreement to do so, uh, and in fact, uh, the, and the Japanese passed uh, a diet resolution and made it almost like a treaty uh, commitment. Uh, thirdly, uh, he uh, floated the idea of an East Asian community, uh, getting inspiration from the experience in Europe, and uh, this was unnerving uh, to the United States. I personally believe that the Obama administration uh, misinterpreted uh, the East Asian community uh, idea uh, as something that would exclude uh, the United States from regional uh, processes. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, as uh, Jeffrey Bader states in his book, uh, he uh, saw the East Asian community initiative 
as something very much akin to Mahathir's uh, vision of an East Asian economic grouping uh, that excluded uh, the United States uh, from uh, East uh, Asia. Hatoyama's vision was strongly resisted uh, by Washington, and it, pr and it provoked tensions, if not a crisis, in U.S.-Japanese uh, uh, relations. I am quite critical of the United States' uh, approach to Japan uh, during this uh, period. Uh, although I was strongly supportive of the Obama administration, I think the Obama administration mismanaged relations with Japan uh, by misunderstanding uh, what Prime Minister Hatoyama uh, was proposing regarding the East Asian uh, community and by focusing so much of the attention and political capital on both sides uh, on a piece of real estate uh, in uh, Okinawa. Uh, but at the end of the day, Prime Minister Hatoyama also had to bear a lot of the responsibility uh, because of his weak and in many ways inept political leadership. Uh, if the United States was not re reassured by what he was proposing to do, uh, then a lot of the blame uh, falls on Prime Minister Hatoyama uh, himself. Well, after the poor leadership of Hatoyama, uh, there was some kind of rebalancing again uh, by his successors, Prime Minister Khan and Noda. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the legacy of the Hatoyama administration was to so tarnish the reputation of the Democratic Party of Japan uh, that uh, in the general election of December 2012, uh, the DPJ suffered a stunning uh, defeat and brought the Liberal Democratic Party back into power. The LDP got back into power not because it won a huge electoral mandate. In fact, uh, the amount of uh, support that the LDP got in the proportional representation vote was not much larger uh, than what they got in 2009 when the LDP was roundly defeated uh, by uh, the Democratic Party of Japan. So this was not a great victory for the Liberal Democratic Party. Rather, it was a, uh, a sign of voter rejection of the DPJ. It was anybody uh, but uh, the DPJ. Well, as you know, after December 2012, Shinzo Abe returns to power as prime minister, and he provides an alternative vision to a challenge to the Yoshida uh, doctrine. It's a vision uh, from the center right, or some might argue uh, from the right. It is an alternative vision of Japanese foreign and defense policy, not only uh, to Hatoyama's vision, but also uh, to the venerable Yoshida uh, doctrine. Uh, first of all, uh, after coming into office, uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe has reversed uh, a decade-long uh, uh, trend of declining uh, defense expenditures. The amazing thing is that uh, all during the Koizumi administration, uh, when Japan was having tensions with China over Yasukuni uh, that uh, uh, the Japanese uh, decreased its defense uh, spending over that same uh, period. In addition to reversing this decline in defense spending, uh, Prime Minister Abe has now begun to uh, move vigorously uh, to promote a reinterpretation and ultimately a revision of the post-war constitution. He has also uh, been pushing uh, behind the scenes for Japan to move beyond a strictly defensive defense doctrine, uh, which uh, uh, would include not only uh, the exercise of the right of collective self-defense, but Japan acquiring capabilities uh, to launch a preemptive attack on such targets as North Korea, if North Korea uh, had uh, was a uh, if there was clear intelligence that North Korea uh, was a about to launch uh, a missile against uh, Japan. And then most importantly, I think uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, is seeking uh, to break Japan out 
of the post-war regime or mentality, as he calls it, uh, that Japan should have much, uh, Japanese should have much greater pride in not only Japan's cultural heritage, uh, but also uh, its historical uh, past. Now, during the initial months of the Abe administration, uh, the second time around, uh, Abe appeared to have learned the lessons of the disastrous uh, first time uh, in uh, office. Uh, rather than focusing on his nationalistic agenda, like changing the educational system or changing the constitution, uh, he decided uh, to focus on the economy. Uh, he followed Bill, dictum, uh, Bill Clinton's uh, dictum, that is the economy uh, stupid. And through Abenomics, through quantitative uh, easing, uh, the stock prices in Japan have soared, uh, the yen has appreciated, uh, and Prime Minister Abe has very high approval ratings. And it looks like Abe's Liberal Democratic Party uh, will almost certainly uh, win a big victory uh, in the upper house uh, elections. Uh, the only question is how large that victory will be. And so now Abe appears to be eager, in fact, somewhat impatient, to use this political capital on behalf of the goals that he cares most about security policy, constitutional revision, and transforming Japan's post-war uh, national uh, identity. Uh, and, you know, from the, from the perspective of uh, Washington, um, Abe's vision seems more preferable uh, than uh, Hatoyama's. Uh, despite the so-called U.S. rebalancing towards Asia, or the strategic pivot in Asia, uh, the United States is suffering uh, from a fiscal crisis which constrains itself from maintaining a robust military presence in the region on its own, despite the best of intentions. Uh, because uh, China's military capabilities are rising, uh, and just to stay ahead, the United States needs to make uh, major investments investments uh, in terms of its military posture in order to maintain its primacy. And therefore, the United States will look to its allies, like Japan, uh, like Australia, uh, for help in this rebalancing uh, strategy. Now before, uh, you know, when I began to study Japanese security policy, uh, many U.S. policymakers uh, uh, told me uh, that they tended to see the U.S.-Japan alliance as a cork in the bottle, uh, something uh, that uh, prevents uh, the remilitarization of Japan. And this view uh, was shared uh, by Chinese leaders like Zhou Enlai. Uh, but now with the rise of China, uh, there is indeed widespread support in Washington for not only tightening uh, the bilateral defense uh, relationship and promoting defense cooperation between the United States and Japan, uh, but uh, uh, there is uh, much greater support uh, for a stronger Japanese defense capability and broadening uh, the geographic horizons of Japanese uh, security policy. And many American commentators, think tank reports, have uh, now openly supported uh, Japan reinterpreting or revising uh, its uh, constitution. But during the last two months, after Abe's visit to Washington, D.C. in February of this year, I believe that the United States has shifted uh, from its positive embrace of Abe uh, to one of ambivalence and concern. I wouldn't say uh, it goes as far as alarm uh, but there is certainly a great uh, deal of discomfort. Uh, the U.S.-Japan alliance uh, may be pivotal to the U.S. strategic pivot in Asia, uh, but uh, from the viewpoint of the United States, uh, there are indeed uh, some uh, major uh, challenges. And let me just uh, go through some of these uh, challenges. One, of course, is the issue of Japan's constitutional reinterpretation 
and revision, and the way uh, it is linked up uh, to the issue of national identity and the issue of historical memory. One of, the, one of the dilemmas that the United States has always had in terms of promoting its defense agenda uh, with uh, Japan uh, is that uh, those in Japan who are most vigorous in accepting the American push for a more robust defense role by Japan are those who have a view of history uh, that are antithetical to the narrative that Americans have and a view of history uh, that tends to irritate or alienate uh, other uh, Asians. And so the problem today is not so much uh, that Japan is considering exercising the right of collective self-defense. Uh, For surely, uh, this is almost a no-brainer exercise. Um, uh, the right of collective and individual self-defense is recognized in the United Nations Charter. All nations have that right and can exercise it. And it is enshrined explicitly in the U.S.-Japan Security uh, Treaty. And being able to exercise the right of collective self-defense would enable Japan uh, to uh, tighten its defense cooperation with the United States, but also it would relax the constraints that Japanese self-defense forces currently have in participating fully uh, in U.S. peacekeeping missions that might require uh, the use of force. So uh, if we're just looking uh, at the issue of uh, the right of collective self-defense, then it seems that this should not be uh, problematic. But it's the current context in which this is being discussed. I always felt uh, that, uh, you know, and I've, I've been supporting uh, Japanese constitutional reinterpretation and revision uh, for decades, but I thought as a precondition uh, for this, so that this did not become a destabilizing factor in East Asian security, is that Japan would have to make greater progress in terms of historical reconciliation with its East Asian uh, neighbors. Uh, but today, rather than seeing a further movement in reconciliation, unfortunately what we see, I think, uh, is some backsliding uh, from the efforts at reconciliation uh, that we saw uh, during the mid-1990s. Uh, uh, and so if Japan were to move in the direction of constitutional reinterpretation without greater progress uh, of reconciliation with South Korea and China, uh, this could exacerbate regional tensions. And what I'm most concerned about are some of uh, Prime Minister Abe's recent statements about aggression, his temptation uh, to go uh, to the Yasukuni Shrine. I mean, that's one of the great regrets he has, that he failed to go to the Yasukuni Shrine when he was Prime Minister uh, the last time around. And many of his nationalist advisors have been advising him that now uh, he must uh, uh, go. And then you read some of the, the really alarming and uh, disgusting statements about uh, comfort women uh, uh, recently. Uh, so all of this has led to a lot of discomfort in Washington. And if this were not enough, then there is the revision of Article 96. I mean, who knew, knew that this would become such an issue? Article 96 is the, uh, the article in the Constitution which stipulates uh, how the Constitution ought to be amended. Uh, right now, according to Article 96, uh, the Japanese National Diet has to pass by a two-thirds majority a resolution uh, for the revision of the Constitution, and then uh, there would be a simple majority vote in a national referendum. Prime Minister Abe would like to revise Article 96 so that only a simple majority is required uh, to revise the Constitution. So in many ways, constitutional law is diminished to the level of a regular piece of legislation. And then the LDP revision draft would put constraints on fundamental human rights by giving priority to the protection of public interest 
and public order. I cannot help but be reminded of the peace preservation law uh, that was passed during the 1920s. So beyond the issue of defense, uh, there is a potential that the moves that Prime Minister Abe would like to make would weaken or even threaten post-war Japanese uh, democracy. Um, now, what's interesting is that there isn't widespread public support in Japan for these policies. And I've looked at a number of public opinion polls, although a lot of Japanese think that Japan should revise its constitution, but if you look at what things they ought that should be revised, they don't think it should be the revision of Article 9, and there isn't that much support for changing Article uh, 96. And all of this, despite the fact that Japanese are increasingly irritated by China and, and increasingly having a negative view towards uh, uh, China. Uh, uh, the negative views of China have not translated into robust public support for a stronger military uh, or uh, the revision of Article uh, 9. Now, I was asked in an interview uh, after I came to Canberra uh, whether uh, Abe is uh, stoking the fans of nationalism in order to build up political capital so he can pursue economic uh, reform. I mean, that may be the logic uh, in other countries, but in Japan, it's just the reverse. Abe is using the economy to build up political capital so that he can pursue his revisionist agenda. A second challenge uh, for the U.S.-Japan alliance in the coming years uh, is, of course, the Okinawa issue and uh, the base realignment issue. Uh, I've been intimately involved in this issue uh, since September 1995, uh, when you had uh, the inexcusable rape of, a ja of an Okinawan schoolgirl uh, by three U.S. Uh, service men. Uh, this was a major crisis in U.S.-Japan uh, relations, uh, and the uh, high support rate uh, for the U.S.-Japan alliance in Japan dissipated uh, very quickly in the wake uh, of this uh, incident. And so as a result, uh, the United States and Japan in 1996 came to an agreement where the United States committed itself to close down the Futenma Marine Air Station, which is located in a highly urbanized area of Okinawa. Uh, and the idea was that uh, that air station would close down within seven years. That's 2003. And so we are now uh, 10 years beyond that deadline. In 2006, a new agreement was made to build a V-shaped air station on the coast uh, off of Henoko Bay in the northern part of Okinawa, uh, and 8,000 Marines uh, would leave Okinawa and go to Guam. As you know, this issue has been in deadlock uh, after uh, Hatoyama uh, reframed uh, this uh, issue, and there has been a fundamental change in Okinawa opinion. Uh, all of the executives of cities, towns, and villages in Okinawa, whether they are conservative or, or progressive, are opposed uh, to the Henoko Bay Ftema replacement uh, facility. But Prime Minister Abe is making a big push to get Governor Nakayama to sign off on this plan. Uh, under the scenes, uh, there is blatant uh, bribery uh, of the locality uh, near which this new air station is supposed uh, to be uh, located. Uh, but it is very difficult for Governor Nakayama uh, to sign off on this. And he has told me many times that even if he did sign off on this, this is not uh, the end of the matter. It's only the beginning of the matter uh, because uh, there will be a large majority of Okinawans who are against this plan and they will move uh, to obstruct the construction of this plan. The United States and the Japanese government have warned Okinawa 
that if Okinawa does not accept the Henoko plan, then Futenma will surely remain open as it is. And then the United States would be backtracking from a commitment that it made to Japan in 1996. This is an accident waiting to happen. Uh, nine years ago, there was a wake-up call. In 2004, a helicopter crashed onto the campus of uh, uh, the Okinawa International uh, University. Uh, luckily, uh, there were no uh, uh, fatalities uh, from that uh, uh, crash. But what it surely shows that there is need uh, for an alternative plan to the one that exists. Keeping Futenma open as it is today is not uh, an option. Uh, certainly, uh, that would uh, uh, begin to weaken the very foundations of the will of the Okinawan people to host uh, other facilities uh, on their island prefecture. A fourth issue uh, is, of course, the Senkaku Daoyu Island uh, uh, dispute. Uh, this has become an intractable and dangerous conflict uh, after the central government purchased three of uh, these islands. Now, this issue uh, had been dormant until the 1990s. It began to raise this uh, head uh, uh, during the 1990s uh, with the construction of a lighthouse by Japanese nationalists uh, by Chinese, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwanese activists trying to get on the island. But all during the 1990s and even during the 2000s, under the Khoisme period, uh, the two countries uh, managed uh, to uh, deal with uh, uh, these issues uh, without further uh, escalation. But what has happened uh, since September uh, 2010 I think is a categorical transformation of this uh, uh, dispute. And I say September 2010 because without the mishandling of the fishing trawler incident in September 2010, I don't think Governor Ishihara would have gotten the traction that he did to purchase those islands. And it was because of the September 2010 mismanagement of the crisis that uh, the government of Prime Minister Noda could not uh, publicly distance himself uh, from uh, Ishihara's uh, provocative and counterproductive uh, moves. Well, now, uh, uh, after uh, the central government's uh, purchase, uh, the China uh, has uh, made frequent intrus intrusions not only to the contiguous waters of these islands, but unto uh, the territorial waters claimed by uh, Japan. And China has stated that it cannot uh, st stop these intrusions unless Japan is willing to recognize that there is a dispute. Because the Chinese blame Japan for provoking ch China. It is Japan that changed uh, the status quo. But the Japanese government has stated that there is no agreement to shelve the issue and that there is no uh, dispute. Now, there was some flexibility expressed uh, during the latter days of the Noda government when Foreign Minister Gemba uh, stated uh, that although uh, Japan has unquestionable sovereignty uh, over the islands, he did recognize that there is a diplomatic issue uh, between Japan and uh, China. But unfortunately, the Abe government appears to have retreated uh, from uh, the Gemba statement. And therefore, it is hard for Japan and China to have a dialogue about uh, this issue. Now, what's the US position on this? Well, the US position is not that of neutrality. The US position is that it has no position on the sovereignty question, but it is not neutral in this dispute either. Japan is an ally of the United States. And therefore, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has stated uh, that the United States opposes unilateral actions that seek to change the status quo that is the administrative control of Japan. Now, of course, the United States has stated 
because Japan has administrative control over those islands that the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty applies. But I think it's very important for Japan to understand that this is not an automatic tripwire for U.S. military involvement. The treaty does state uh, that uh, the two countries must act to meet common dangers according to constitutional provisions and processes, uh, but the involvement is not automatic. The United States wants de-escalation and communication. Uh, they want uh, China and Japan uh, to uh, promote confidence building measures, crisis prevention measures, and incidents at sea agreements. But China will be hard pressed to discuss this while Japan insists that there is no issue or dispute about these islands. Now, since I'm running out of time, I'll go very quickly uh, on the North uh, Korea issue. And of course, this is a complicated uh, issue. But I just wanted to touch on uh, another problem in the U.S.-Japan uh, relationship. It was the recent visit of one of Abe's key advisors and the closest advisor to former Prime Minister Koizumi, Mr. Ijima, uh, who uh, supposedly made a secret uh, visit uh, to uh, North Korea to talk about the abduction issue. I was just in Tokyo and was trying to find out the background on this, and it seemed that during the DPJ government, uh, there was a trip by, uh, uh, two trips made uh, by a high official uh, in uh, the Democratic Party uh, of Japan staff, uh, but no one knew about it. But this time, in this secret mission, the North Koreans played this up and the whole world uh, uh, knew about it. And it was clear that North Korea is trying to drive a wedge between Japan on the one hand and the United States and South Korea uh, on the other. Uh, the United States uh, was quite irritated, uh, to say the least, uh, that the United States was not uh, consulted about this move. Uh, and as we know, uh, this seemed to undermine the effort of trying to bring together the United States, South Korea, Japan, and China in a united front uh, to put pressure on the North Korean uh, regime. But when you look at it in the long term, I can see reasons uh, for uh, this uh, approach uh, to North Korea. Abe would never have become prime minister had it not been for his hardline stance on the abduction issue. And if he were able to make progress and resolve this abduction issue, uh, then uh, he would be treated as a political hero in Japan. But on top of that, uh, Japan's strategic maneuverability on the North Korean issue uh, has been limited, severely limited, uh, because of the abduction is issue. I mean, if you go back to the last days of the administration of George W. Bush, it was Japan that had great difficulty signing on to a major engagement policy towards North Korea uh, because uh, they were shackled uh, by the abduction issue. So although at this present moment, uh, this has been a source of tensions between the United States and Japan and Japan and South Korea, in the long term, uh, if there's a way to overcome the abduction issue, then uh, Japan would have more maneuverability. Okay, well, in the time remaining, uh, what are the implications for Australia? Uh, well, I, I have... Uh, kind of four uh, implications. One uh, is on the issue of historical uh, reconciliation. Uh, Japan and Australia also had a history uh, issue. Uh, and uh, when the United States, under the Truman administration, uh, was trying to promote a multilateral security pact known as the Pacific Pact, uh, it was opposed by the Philippines and Australia, not because Australia and the Philippines did not want a security relationship with the United States. Of course they did. But it was because it would be impossible uh, for an Australian government to convince uh, the Australian people after the atrocities that Japan committed against Australian soldiers uh, that Australia would have a 
commitment in the context of a multilateral alliance to defend uh, Japan. And so it's not surprising uh, the way South Koreans might feel about security cooperation uh, with the Japanese uh, today. Well, now we know uh, that the process of reconciliation between Japan and Australia uh, has moved uh, quite uh, far. And so perhaps Australia can facilitate the process of historical reconciliation in Northeast Asia by encouraging dialogue and providing lessons from the process of reconciliation between Japan and Australia. Secondly, uh, implication for Australia. Okinawa, uh, in uh, 1996, Michael Hannon and I, uh, inspired by some conversations we had with the U.S. Marine Commandant at the time, Krulak, uh, proposed the rotation of Marines uh, to Darwin, uh, Australia. Uh, now uh, this is seems to be becoming a, a reality, although I'd like to know whether Australians are willing to pay for this or not. Uh, uh, but this might provide a model for the reduction of the marine presence in Okinawa so that Futema can be closed without, that is without, the construction of the, of the Futema replacement facility at Henoko Bay. You know, I think that uh, one viable uh, alternative to the current plan is for U.S. Marine Corps, the bulk of the combat forces, to move back to the continental United States, to CONUS, to pre-position equipment in the region, to have the rotation of forces uh, in the region and have joint training exercises, but what will remain is just the 31st MU logistic units and the headquarters, and with that, you could really close down a lot of the, uh, the marine facilities in Okinawa. So to the extent, to the extent that Australia can help out in promoting this model of regional rotation, I think Australia can contribute uh, to uh, a resolution of the Okinawa question. A third uh, is regarding uh, uh, the territorial uh, disputes. I know Australia has a lot of concern about Chinese assertiveness, uh, not only in the East China Sea, but the South China Sea. But I think Australia can be a good voice for the need for a, uh, a code of conduct uh, for efforts at uh, de-escalating uh, the conflict, promoting communication, and crisis uh, prevention. And the more that Japan's friends and allies uh, can promote this point, I think this would constrain uh, Mr. Abe from doing something that further uh, exacerbates uh, this conflict. And then finally, it's about uh, the multilateralization of the U.S. alliance uh, network. Now, there is no question that the United States uh, uh, has moved and has to move beyond the old hub and spokes alliance network. Uh, and the United States has been trying to promote security cooperation uh, between its allies, between Japan and South Korea, between Japan and Australia. Uh, and this multilateralization of the US alliance network can certainly help uh, to constrain a rising uh, China. And we might uh, include India or some of the Southeast Asian countries in this network uh, to constrain Chinese assertiveness. But this kind of multilateral hedging to counter China's rise is not sufficient. We also need meaningful regional security processes that include China as well as exclude China. In some, way, in some areas, the multilateralized U.S.-led alliance network can be open to China as well uh, to address missions like anti-piracy, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, or search and rescue. It's not the rebalancing in Asia should not be to contain China, but to engage positively China as well as to hedge uh, against an aggressive 
China. In the economic sphere, uh, Japan has already assumed what I think is a wise two-track approach. Japan has decided to participate in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a process that excludes China for the moment. But at the same time, it is promoting RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which strikes, and to me, very much like uh, Hatoyama's East Asian community vision, the so-called ASEAN plus three plus three that includes China and Australia. So Japan and Australia are participants in both the TPP and RCEP. The same kind of dual approach may be appropriate for the security realm as well, a multilateralized alliance to constrain China, but also regional security cooperation and assurances that include China. So what is critically necessary for the U.S. rebalancing towards Asia is getting the right balance. And I hope that countries like Australia and other middle states in the region will help to encourage the right balance in U.S. and Japanese policy towards the rising China, one that combines positive engagement and the right amount of hedging. Now, it may be tempting to say that Australia faces a choice between the United States and China. But at least for now, I believe that that is a false choice. The goal of policy should be to create an environment where such a choice becomes unnecessary. If we eventually face that choice, it will be in part because of our failure not to rebalance, but to find the right balance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike, for that very uh, magisterial survey of a whole raft of issues um, that link uh, history and current strategic circumstances, um, economics and security, um, and that whole raft of issues and potential way, ways through them that you mentioned at the end there. I'm sure there's a number of issues that people would like to raise. We've got about 15, 20 minutes at the most. Um, so can I ask people uh, who are interested to ask a question to just say who you are, if you have an affiliation, uh, to keep your questions uh, reasonably short and to the point so that we can get through as many as possible. That's the first one, Ricky. Uh, Ricky Keston, uh, Department of Political and Social Change uh, at the ANU. Um, Mike, it's a, it's a difficult question, but I can't help um, myself. I need to ask, um, is the only way that the Okinawa issue can be resolved uh, from a Japanese point of view is if Japan accepts a less central place in the US alliance system? Um, the answer is no. Uh, I think, in a sense, the uh, resolution of the Okinawa question uh, uh, would come uh, because Japan uh, assumes a more important and active role in the alliance. You know, I, I've always argued uh, that it's only when uh, Japan can break out of its current constraint about exercising the right of collective self-defense that the United States will feel confident that it could pull back the Marine Corps and then be uh, uh, confident that in times of a crisis that the Japanese would actively support the redeployment of U.S. forces from CONUS. Uh, and, uh, you know, and this is through prepositioning, uh, but opening up uh, not just military, self-defense force military facilities, uh, but civilian facilities uh, if the contingency required. So if there's a, you know, God forbid, a war in the Korean Peninsula, uh, the United States would need a staging area. The staging area will not be in Okinawa. Uh, it will be in Kyushu. I mean, look at the map. Uh, uh, and... Uh, you know, Japan needs uh, to take measures to give confidence uh, uh, to American planners that uh, Japan will help. I'm Leszek Buszynski. I'm visiting fellow at the National Security College. 
And from what you say, and I found your remarks very interesting and very insightful, particularly in relation to the irritation that you described on the American side in relation to the Abe government, but it seems that a rising Japan, if we consider Japan as rising under Abe, uh, may be disruptive of the kind of regional vision that the United States would like to promote uh, for reasons that you explained. And there are various reasons, various, um, for various reasons we could argue that China is becoming more important to the United States than Japan could ever be in terms of uh, handling North Korea, in terms of uh, all the other disputes and other, all the other issues between them. So um, what is the chance of a future United States administration actually cutting a deal with China and leaving Japan on the sides, marginalized, so to speak? Well, uh, th that is one of the nightmares that the Japanese have, uh, that there will be some uh, U.S.-China uh, condominium. Uh, and uh, you know, one certainly can't dismiss that, that possibility. Uh, but I think uh, reaching uh, such a condominium, such uh, a mutual uh, accommodation, will be difficult uh, without uh, the Japanese being part of this. Uh, and, and this is in part because uh, with the rise of China and the relative decline of the United States, uh, then uh, the United States needs Japan uh, even more. I mean, if you know, they, the United States might be tempted to cut this deal, uh, but it would be a deal that probably would not be as attractive as if Japan uh, were part of this. Uh, and and so, looking at it from the Japanese point of view, you know, and and some of my friends who think that the uh, the thing that will solve all of this is the revival of the Japanese economy. You know, once the Japanese economy revives, uh, the argument is that the United States uh, would have to factor in uh, Japan, and so would uh, uh, so would China. But you're absolutely right that you know this is always uh, the scenario that the Japanese worry about. I'm uh, Ben Chapman Schmidt with uh, Regulatory Institutions Network. I wanted to ask you about uh, China's foreign policy, especially its belligerent stance in the South China Sea, and whether or not you think that might not push, uh, particularly the ASEAN nations, but also possibly South Korea, that also has territorial disputes with China, into forming some sort of anti-China alliance with Japan. Sort of containment strategy there. Well, first of all, it's uh, very hard to read what's driving uh, China. I mean, there's no question that China has become increasingly assertive, if not blatantly uh, aggressive. But what I is driving uh, this? And you know, of course, when you talk to the Chinese, they would say it's a reaction to the provocation by these other. Uh, uh, countries. But then once the pr uh, provocation takes place, then it seems that China has seized the opportunity then uh, to change uh, the status quo. Um, and uh, what ultimately might constrain China is that they find that this is uh, counterproductive, that this leads to a self-encirclement. Self -encirclement. Uh, and you're absolutely right that if you look at uh, Japan, the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, and then maybe Australia too, uh, 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 views of China have become increasingly negative. South Korea is, is in a very ambivalent position, and uh, uh, the concerns about Japan is one of the reasons why uh, I, I think uh, uh, South Korea is in, a, in, in, a benevolent, uh, in, in an ambivalent uh, position. But uh, the question uh, for me is, if such kind of self-encirclement happens, because these trends continue, what will be China's response? Will it back down? Will it kind of learn the lessons? Or will it uh, do what Japan did uh, in the 1930s, is to keep pushing ahead, uh, because they think uh, that this encircling coalition is basically a paper tiger or, or provocative. And so what it basically leads to is a downward spiral. And you don't know. There's a logic to both. And I think a lot of it depends on a very sophisticated uh, understanding uh, of uh, Chinese kind of 
domestic politics. And so one thing I, I would encourage at this point is not to make it into a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. That you know there are moderates in the Chinese political system, and even though we uh, act firmly in the face of Chinese aggressive moves, that there also has to be uh, a positive engagement so as to uh, nurture and, and uh, promote uh, uh, the moderation. You know, now, once you know, there is no moderation, you know, like uh, you had in Japan in the mid-1930s, uh, then uh, full-blown containment may be necessary. But at this point, I don't think uh, it's necessary. Uh, professor, recognizing that uh, Japan's relationship with two of its neighbors, uh, South Korea and China, seems to be continually undermined by a failure to come to terms with its military history of World War II, what are the chances of this being overcome so that uh, they could then concentrate on the bigger strategic issues? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, difficult issue. and. Uh, you know, I've looked at the German case and have been inspired by a number of, of uh, terrific works on this, you know, like uh, uh, that of uh, Thomas Berger and Lily Gardner Feldman. Uh, and uh, um, you know, although Germany is held up as the model for Japan, uh, even in, for Germany, it was very difficult. And it's a continuing uh, process. And it is not just at the state-to-state -state level, but at the societal level. Level. So first of all, I think one needs to uh, understand the enormity of the, of the task. Uh, and that reconciliation is not some end point, uh, but it's an ongoing uh, process. And I think, you know, compared to where Japan was in the 1960s, where Japan was in the mid-1990s, uh, there was a lot of progress. And in fact, the nationalism that emerged was in part a reaction to the steps that uh, uh, people uh, like Prime Minister Hosokawa, uh, Prime Minister Murayama uh, uh, made. Um, you know, for me, one of the tragedies is the failure of the Hatoyama government. Uh, because Prime Minister Hatoyama and some of his closest advisors really wanted to push uh, on the reconciliation issue. And, and you'll see how uh, Prime Minister Khan, you know, try to deal with the 100th year anniversary of Korea's uh, uh, annexation. And so these are these were steps. And so there was, I think, a real missed opportunity. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that under the DPJ this problem would have been solved. But if you look at, at Germany, it was only after the rise of the SPD to power that Germany moves away from its own victim narrative to a perpetrator uh, narrative. And so uh, what I find depressing is that this opportunity was lost and that there is no countervailing power at this point uh, 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 to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Abe. Uh, and so uh, now the challenge is even uh, greater, but, but I think in that sense, uh, the friends of Japan uh, need to say that dealing with the history issue, just like for Germans, is not an instance of masochistic history, uh, but a uh, something of national pride. I mean, that's what Willy Brandt did. You know, the Germans embraced post-war democracy because Germany, more than other countries, could do what is most difficult: is to look at the past squarely uh, and then uh, try to overcome them. sort of a, a multilateralization of the San Francisco system or the hub and spoke system. Uh, from the Australian perspective, we're pretty reticent about involving our things in Northeast, involving ourselves in uh, Northeast Asian security affairs. Uh, this would seem to pose a whole bunch of entrapment risks and deprive us of the ability to pass the buck to the US and Japan. Why would this be in Australia's interest? Right, right. Well, um, at the end of the day, if all hell breaks loose uh, in, uh, break, uh, in, in Northeast Asia, 
it's going to have an impact uh, on Australia. Uh, and so, of course, uh, Australia could be there in splendid uh, isolation. Uh, but uh, my understanding is Australia is increasingly integrated uh, into the East Asian economy. It has redefined itself as part of the Asia uh, Pacific. And so, uh, you know, Australia choosing one side in this could lead to entrapment. But I think Australia, just like other middle states, middle powers in the region, have a stake in making sure that great powers you know, get the balance right, uh, you know, between kind of hedging uh, and cooperation. And so I'm not saying that Australia should sign up on in a multilateralized alliance to contain China. Uh, but by being part of this multilateralized alliance network, Australia can have a, a voice uh, in how to manage these territorial disputes and even a voice in how to promote historical reconciliation. Uh, David Martin, um, just an interested person. Could you ever see uh, China using its clout with its Made in China uh, logo, which is probably adorns 95% of the clothes w uh, currently in this room, where if we actually don't do what the Chinese want, they can just say, fine, ban all exports from China to a country, for example, us. Pick on somebody small. I mean, we're the same size as Shanghai. Yeah, right. Well... Uh, you know, some uh, Chinese may be tempted to, to, to take that uh, uh, approach, but uh, as uh, breathtaking as China's uh, economic trajectory uh, has been, uh, there are a lot of vulnerabilities. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, even though they may not depend on Japanese ODA like in the past, uh, they need Japanese investments. I've heard uh, even at, at the height of Sino-Japanese tensions over the Senkaku Dalyu dispute, uh, localities, local governments uh, have been very much interested in maintaining Japanese investments and businesses uh, because the Japanese tend to reinvest their profits uh, uh, locally. They want access to Japanese technology. They want access to Japanese environmental uh, technology. So, uh, yeah, you know, uh, China could threaten to cut off economic ties, uh, but it would uh, also pay a price uh, uh, for that. I'd now like to uh, conclude the evening by asking uh, Professor Veronica Taylor to um, uh, pass a vote of thanks uh, to Mike. And uh, Veronica wears a number of hats in relation to the organization sponsoring this evening, but in particular she is the, is the director here at the ANU um, of the School of, of Regulation, Justice and Diplomacy. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, Mike, you've given us a really full and frank and expert account of the evolution of the US-Japan alliance, and it would appear that well, we're well past Japan's incremental normalisation. And so this evening we really appreciate the opportunity to hear from you and uh, together to probe some of the flashpoints and the difficult choices ahead. You told us this was your first visit to Australia. We most certainly hope it won't be your last. Um, thank you very much for, for making the, the journey. Please join me in thanking uh, Professor Mike Mochizuki. <laughs>